by Sarah Costa and Alyssa Yances. My home is south, but where is south? Have no fear, Costa's here. What's wrong? I'm lost and I can't find my house. I know I live south of the forest, but which way south? Well, I'll teach you how to make a compass. Ready? Here are a few things you will need. Something that floats, like a leaf. Yeah, perfect. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Uh, something made out of steel, like a bobby pin or a sewing needle. I have a bobby pin in my hair. Great. Now we're gonna need a small body of water, like a puddle. Okay, there's a puddle right there. Perfect. First, you will need to magnetize the bobby pin. To do this, you will have to rub it on a magnet. However, because we don't have one, you can rub it against your hair or the fur on your jacket. Remember to stroke the bobby pin in the same direction. You will need to do this between 50 and 100 times. Place the leaf in the water and place the bobby pin on top. If a breeze hits the compass, it may have trouble aligning itself north to south. Try to shield the compass from the wind. Next, you will need to assess your compass's magnetism. Slowly spin either clockwise or counterclockwise. If it doesn't move, rub the bobby pin again to magnetize it further. Now we will need to figure out which way is north. You can do this by using the shadow method. Place a stick upright in the ground so you can see its shadow. Mark the spot where the tip of the shadow falls with a rock or a stick. Wait 15 minutes. Then mark the shadow's tip with a second rock or stick. The line between the rocks or sticks is roughly east to west. If you stand with the first rock on your left and the second rock on your right, you are facing north. If it is nighttime, use the stars to figure out which direction is north. Locate the north star, the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper constellation. Draw an imaginary line from the north star to the ground. The direction of the line is due north. There you have it. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Essentially, a compass is nothing more than a magnetized needle floating in a liquid responding to Earth's magnetic fields, consequently revealing direction. It functions as a pointer to magnetic north, the local magnetic meridian, because the magnetized needle at its heart aligns itself with the horizontal component of Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic field exerts a torque on the needle pulling one end or pole of the needle approximately towards Earth's north magnetic pole and pulling the other toward the south magnetic pole. So if this were the needle here, it would be pulling it towards north as well as pulling it the other end towards the south. The needle is mounted on a low friction pivot point. In better compasses, a jewel bearing so it can turn more easily. For the purposes of this example, I don't actually have a compass but instead I'm using an app from an iPhone phone. So where it would be, the jewel bearing would be here, that would be the liquid, and that would be the needle that would float on top of it. When the compass is held level, the needle turns until it settles into its equilibrium orientation. In navigation, directions on map are usually expressed with reference to geographical or true north, the direction towards the geographical north pole. Depending on where the compass is located on the surface of the Earth, the angle between true north and magnetic north, called magnetic declination, can vary widely with geographic location. Over time, compass markers have added features which make compasses work more harmoniously with maps and also more beneficially as standalone tools. In this video, Sarah demonstrated how to build a compass 
in the wild. In this video, I was able to show our viewers how to build a simple magnetic compass. Initially, I asked Alyssa for a steel metal, and she gave me a bobby pin from her hair. Steel is an iron alloy, additionally comprised of other elements, mainly carbon. Due to the magnetic properties of iron, it easily accepts electrons. Paramagnetism refers to the magnetic state of an atom with one or more unpaired electrons. The unpaired electrons are attracted by a magnetic field due to the electron's magnetic dipole moment. Hund's rule states that electrons must occupy every orbital singly before any orbital is doubly occupied. This may leave the atom with many unpaired electrons. Because unpaired electrons can orient in either direction, they exhibit magnetic moments that can align with a magnet. This capability allows paramagnetic atoms to be attracted to magnetic fields. Similarly, iron is ferromagnetic, meaning it has a high susceptibility to magnetization, the strength of which depends on that of the applied magnetizing field, and that may persist after removal of the applied field. You can see from this diagram that iron is missing four electrons to complete its valence shell. This causes the metal to be ferromagnetic. By rubbing the bobby pin against Alyssa's hair or the fur on her jacket, the hair or fur transfers electrons to the metal, in this case the bobby pin, to magnetize the pin to create the compass. This magnetized bobby pin now at its heart aligns itself with the horizontal component of the Earth's magnetic field. Fun fact, the polarity of the pin itself is the opposite to the polarity of the Earth. This means that the south pole of the pin points to the geographic south pole of the Earth, but the north pole of the Earth's magnet, and vice versa. Next, the water or puddle in this case allows the pin to move quickly and easily to align itself with the polarity of the earth. The bobby pin is placed on the leaf so it can easily float on the water. And there you have it folks, this is how to build a simple magnetic compass in the wild. Both the valence bond and molecular orbital theories assist chemists to understand and explain chemical bonding between atoms. Specifically, the valence bond theory describes the formation of chemical covalent bonds from the overlap of unpaired electrons within atomic orbitals of two different atoms. Because of the overlap, it is highly probable that a pair of electrons are found in the physical region or space where or orbitals overlap. As we have learned, a sigma bond forms when two atomic orbitals overlap between the nuclei of two atoms, the internuclear axis. Pi bonds form when two atomic orbitals overlap outside of the internuclear axis. In contrast, molecular orbital theory describes the production of molecular orbitals from the combination of atomic orbitals in a molecule. This theory can predict magnetic and ionization properties. In molecular orbital theory, molecular orbitals form the overlap of atomic orbitals. These molecular orbitals are delocalized over the molecule. The atomic orbitals are most effectively combined if they are of similar energy. A simple example is of a homogeneous diatomic gas. In this case, the orbitals of the same level and type, 3s or 4p for example, are exactly the same energy and thus bond very well. More complex molecules involve the use of symmetry and group theory. Atomic orbital energy correlates with electronegativity, as electronegative atoms hold electrons more tightly, lowering their energies. This theory modeling is only valid when the atomic orbitals have comparable energy. When the energies differ greatly, the bonding mode becomes ionic. A second condition for overlapping atomic orbitals is that they have identical symmetry. Two atomic orbitals can overlap in two ways, depending on their phase relationship. An orbital's phase is a direct consequence of electrons' wave-like properties. In graphical representations of orbitals, the orbital phase is depicted either by a plus or minus sign, 
or by shading one lobe. The sign of the phase itself does not have physical meaning except when mixing orbitals to form molecular orbitals. Two same sign orbitals have a constructive overlap or interference, forming a molecular orbital with the bulk of the electron density located between the two nuclei. This molecular orbital is called the bonding orbital, and its energy is lower than that of the original atomic orbitals. Two different sign orbitals have destructive overlap or interference, which reduces the probability that the electron will be in that bond. A molecule is said to be stable or able to exist in some form if it has a bond order, or put more simply, more bonding molecular orbitals with filled electrons than anti-bonding molecular orbitals with filled electrons. Both order, bond order can also be used to verify that the molecular orbital diagram is efficient and even gives us an insight into the bond distance. We want the same bond order from the molecular orbital diagram as the number of bonds in the molecule. Bonding molecular orbitals are lower in energy than anti-bonding molecular orbitals.